In this video, you're gonna learn how to easily perform a SQL injection attack from scratch. And at the end of the video, I'm gonna show you exactly how I use this attack to get illegitimate access to an actual company's data as part of a bug bounty program. But first, what even is a SQL injection attack? How does it work? To answer that question, we'll need to see exactly how a vulnerability like this is created. Tell me, website developer, what progress have you made on our website? Our website is finally complete, SQL guy. Remind me, how does this website work again? The user will input search terms, which then will be passed into a SQL query that searches for the results in your SQL database. That's great to hear, website developer. Tell me, how exactly are we going to pass user input into the SQL query? What do you mean, silly? We're just gonna pass it. And we're not going to check the user input beforehand? That's correct. Or filter it whatsoever? Yeah, we aren't going to check anything. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? Hi, my name is John Hacker. I'd like to use your website, please. Why, certainly, Mr. Hacker. And what would you like to search for? I'll search for... hmm... How about the usernames and passwords of every user account? Wa ha 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 ha! Of course I'm not giving you that! Do you think I'm some sort of idiot or something? What's this query you're passing me here? Oh yeah, I've done it again! Another company pwn! <laughs> if only we just filtered user inputs. No. As it turns out, SQL injections really are as easy as passing your unfiltered input into a SQL query. The way you set up your input varies a lot, and it depends on both the SQL version that you're attacking and how the specific application's set up. All right, let's try an example. Let's say website developer and SQL man are building a website that lets the user search for US presidents. A typical SQL query might look something like, select all from presidents where name equals user input. What we can then do is inject our own SQL code into this user input. A lot of times we'll have access to this through a search bar or some sort of HTTP request parameters. One easy SQL injection test method is to put a single quote as the user input. That leads to the query, select all from presidents, where name equals quote quote quote. This is a syntax error, and it will cause something to break on the backend if there's a vulnerability. If the devs are really lazy, then sometimes an unfiltered SQL error will display on the main page. Another way SQL injection can be tested is to put in a valid query, like this. Obama quote semicolon dash dash. This would return the same results as just typing Obama, confirming that SQL injection exists. At this point, John Hacker is pretty sure there's a vulnerability, so it's time for him to start messing around. One attack that usually works is the union attack, where you can use a union statement to put another select statement at the end of the SQL query. This will probably cause an error because the number of variables in the new select needs to match the number of variables in the previous select, which we don't know. To find the right number of variables, the strat here is to increase the number of nulls until it returns something that looks normal. I'm just gonna keep shooting nulls until the database explodes. Now that we have the right number of nulls, we can now see if any of them contain the string data type. To do this, just put a single letter instead of the null. If it doesn't break, it's a string. Let's say that the second null contains a string. If you get to this point, congratulations! you pretty much have the ability to ask the SQL database for anything that you want. If you want the good stuff, like database credentials or hashed passwords, a good way to start is to see what databases exist. Each SQL server usually has a few different databases, each containing a lot of tables, which in turn contain columns which store data. Information Schema is basically this big database that has all the info about the SQL databases. We can put this into our union attack from earlier to execute the command so we can see what databases exist on the server. Here's a different select that gets you the table names for each database, and you can figure out the columns in each table using this select here. 
A lot of these commands will be different depending on what SQL version you're up against, so it's important to enumerate that. There's an amazing cheat sheet available on PortSwigger, link will be in the description. Using these three commands, we can look through the entire database to hopefully find some loot. We could do this manually, but at this point it wouldn't be a terrible idea to automate it using a Python script. Also, if these commands don't work for you, that's okay. Each SQL injection is different, and how you format your commands depends heavily on how you're getting the output displayed back to you. Once we've found what we're looking for, all we need to do is make two final queries. And boom! Just like that, we've hacked the CIA and exposed all the president's passwords. Now, because some of you are probably yelling at your monitors right now, yes, you can run a tool called SQL Map that usually does an excellent job of automatically detecting and exploiting SQL injections. That said, there have been a lot of times where I've found SQL injections in sites that SQL Map overlooked, so it's by no means a perfect tool. Yes, you should run it, but if SQL Map doesn't detect anything, that does not mean there's no injection. If the SQL database is really set up poorly, you can even get file reads, file writes, and even code execution using SQL injection. I won't show it here, but I'll put some links in the description if you want to check that out. Sometimes you can even get root off of just one SQL injection. It's very epic. Okay, so how do you prevent SQL injections from happening? There's really only one way to fix a SQL injection vulnerability, and that's to run the user input through a filter before passing it to the SQL query. Anything else wouldn't really work, and stupid solutions have the potential to be bypassed by blind SQL injection. Let's look at another example. Website developer, did you filter the user input? Yeah, kinda. What do you mean, kinda? I told you to filter the user input. Well, I programmed it so that SQL errors and query results are not shown to the user. Yeah, seems legit. You sure it'll work? Of course it'll work! There's no way John Hacker can access our data now. Hi, I'd like to use your website again, please. Of course! We're also definitely unhackable, so don't try anything. Okay. Does the first letter of the admin password start with the letter A? If so, delay your response for three seconds. What? How is this possible? Ahahahaha! Ah, 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 ah. Excellent! Now, does the second letter of the admin password start with the letter A? No. How about B? Nope. C? Nope. D? How are you doing this? Got the password. Admin, admin. Website, poem. That was an example of blind, time-based SQL injection. The main idea is you can force the server to respond differently based on whether or not any statement is true or false. It's kind of like playing 20 questions, where you ask the database a lot of true or false style questions until you find whatever you're looking for. Even though it takes a lot longer than normal SQL injection, it's still an equally serious vulnerability since it exposes everything just the same. To find out if there's a blind SQL injection, the first thing you could try is adding an AND statement. In SQL code, 1 equals 1 returns true, and 1 equals 2 returns false. So if an injection exists, something would be different if you tried each of these. Then, you could test one character at a time using something like this. If the application truly tells you nothing and just executes the SQL command anyways, you can still get information by triggering time delays. This will cause the server to delay its response back to you based on if the statement is true or false. Your goal should be to come up with some sort of true or false statement that gets you valuable information, and you can get pretty creative with this. One common trick is to see if the target character equals A, B, C, and going down the list of possible characters. A more advanced trick is to see if the target character is greater than or less than other characters, which can cut down on runtime, but it's a little more tricky. I'd strongly recommend creating a Python script to do this for you, since blind SQL injection takes a lot more requests to get information than a normal SQL injection would. Now that you're an expert on SQL injection, I'm going to walk you through what I use to get illegitimate access to an actual company's internal data as part of a bug bounty program. 
I'm not going to give you any information about which company I worked with, and even if I did, they patched the vulnerability over a year ago anyways, and I've changed a few minor details. As a disclaimer, don't go hacking stuff unless it's 100% legal, and I'm not responsible if you do anything stupid. Here's the final SQL injection in full, and it does look pretty complicated, but I'll do my best to break it down for you. I had to URL encode it too because the input was part of a post request, so this is what the final payload actually looked like, but I'll stick with the cleaner version. This particular SQL injection was actually part of a web request on a login page. The first thing I found out was the website I was attacking ran Microsoft SQL Server. The core vulnerability was that there was a publicly facing SQL error page that could be triggered by putting in various bad characters. I immediately tried running SQL map, but it didn't detect anything, so the second thing I did was to start throwing nulls at it, and four nulls was the right number. In this case, the first null was actually a string, so I on purpose triggered a server error by using the second null instead, which was an integer. This made the error page display a SQL error, which said, conversion failed when converting the nvarchar value A to data type int. And at this point, it's game over, since I have full control and I can read any database values I want to grab. After I discovered this, I immediately contacted the company to report a vulnerability, which is what you should do every time before you exploit anything. In this case, they gave me permission to make a proof of concept. So after I enumerated the database a little bit, I found a table called login table, which happened to store the credentials of all the users. So after a few minutes of Stack Overflow, I concatenated the usernames and passwords into one string and made it iterable so that by changing just one number, you could iterate through all the rows of the login table and grab all the user information at once. This was a little overkill, but it did demonstrate to the company's IT folks that it was a pretty serious vulnerability. Today, injection is still the third most abundant vulnerability on the internet, according to OWASP. SQL injection is one of the stupidest and easiest to fix vulnerabilities out there, but it's still really common, even on sites that hundreds of thousands and even millions of people put their personal information into. So next time you're putting in your password on a shady website, all I'm saying is it wouldn't hurt to put in a single quote or a double dash and just see what happens. I hope you learned something from this video. If you have any questions, please drop a comment below and I'll try to respond. I'm probably going to make a few more of these types of videos in the future, so stay tuned for that. Peace!